So what specifically is happening in dreams? What I've I've heard that what dreams are is it's your unconscious mind. So you have this giant processor uh, processing system in your mind, in your head. And when you're sleeping, there's all that power being used for something. So it's what it's doing is it's it's rendering previous experiences and trying to um, project or predict or put together puzzle pieces in your mind from previous experiences to help you get through future experiences. Exactly. So okay. let it tie to it. Notice what it's doing is dreaming is just running off what we talked about earlier. You mm -hmm. have reconstructive memory. Remember Elizabeth Loftus and the mm -hmm. ice cream is? Right. You have reconstructive memory that's not trying to do memory reconstructing to give you more accuracy. It's trying to make you more insightfully foresightful about the future. Right, okay. And so now the, one of the ways you do this, because we're talking about things like the non-propositional, the, the, you're, you're actually embodied learning. A lot of your learning is done through generate to recognize. We even do this with primates. There was a big talk a while ago about mirror neurons, but it doesn't look like there, there's still some controversy. I don't think there are specialized neurons. Basically though, the neurons in your brain that you use for picking stuff up, you use to recognize when other people are picking stuff up such that I can do this. And a pantomime and what's John doing? Well, he's picking up something even though I'm not actually picking up anything. Mm -hmm. So you use the machinery by which you generate your behavior to recognize other behavior. Okay. And you go back to Jeffrey Hinton, also from the University of Toronto, by the way. <laughs> All right. Uh, you go back to Jeffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, right? And the wake sleep algorithm. So the algorithm is trying to learn about patterns in the world. Trying to learn about patterns is really, really hard. Really hard. It's really complex especially because you'll have partial information, there's multiple mm -hmm. interpretations, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So what you do is you take a sample, you sort of, you, you try and do a compression on it, get some parts of your external pattern that are uh, like a relatively invariant, right? Relatively unchanging, but it's like a, a kernel. It's not the pattern, it's little snippets of the mm -hmm. real world pattern. Then what, did you, what you do is, it's called the wake sleep algorithm. That's when you're, the system's awake. Then the system goes asleep. It disconnects from the world, get mm -hmm. this. And then what it does is it generates, it takes those little kernels and it generates all kinds of fantastic variations on them. Wow. And then you come back and you do, a, the system says, are any of these there? Uh huh. Most of them get killed off, but some of the variations survive and now the system learns. And then you do the cycle again, right? And he even called the, the, the sleep learning, the machine, the machine is generating fantasies of the data. So that's one thing, you're improving your ability. So what you're doing is you're generating variations to, and you're sensitizing yourself to possibilities. Most of those possibilities die off, but some mm -hmm. of them land. Right. Your attention is doing it right now, by the way. You have two attentional systems. You have task focus that's trying to keep on track with this bizarre Canadian professor, <laughs> right? And then you've got the default mode that is doing mind wandering. Your mind wanders off and you start thinking about other things, right? Not during this conversation. <laughs> or, well, now what happens is that this is like evolution, like biological evolution. You have variation and then you kill off most of the variations, but some of the variation survives. And so the, the species evolves. That's how, yeah, okay, yeah. variation and selection, variation and selection. Mm -hmm. Your attention is doing the same thing. You're varying the possibility, possible things you could pay attention to. You're killing most of them off, but you keep a few of those connections and you think of what, what should I say to John next? Mm -hmm. You did enough mind wandering that that variations, that maybe you thought about your laundry and hopefully, and thankfully you didn't bring that into the conversation, yeah. but you thought, oh, well, oh, and then you bring that in and you think about the next thing. So you're constantly evolving your fittedness with your attention. Yeah. You're doing the same thing you're dreaming. You're creating possible variations you're killing most of them off, and those that survive help you better in the future. So if you take a, a, a rat and you prevent it from doing a lot of REM dream, it'll stop reacting adaptively to cats. Oh, really? Yeah, there's been interesting experiments done like that. Now, there's another thing you're doing, and these two can be done at the same time. So this is a problem called, this is Robin Carhart Harris. It's yeah, called yeah. overfitting to the data. Okay, so whenever you're making a prediction, 
I'll try not to get technical about this, but whenever I make a contradiction, I take a sample, like, right? Like I poll people to see what's gonna happen in an election. So the sample isn't the population, the sample is some limited amount. And I try to predict from patterns in the sample, what's gonna happen in the real world population. Okay. Okay. Now the, I have two problems I face. One is I can underfit to the data, which means there's patterns in the data that I haven't picked up on that are in the real world. That's underfitting to the data. Okay. Okay. That's mi the, that's me missing a pattern that I right. should find. Right. I can overfit to the data. I can find patterns in the data that aren't in the population. So, for example, first year I do this with my first year cognitive science students, introduction to cognitive science. How many of you think cognitive science is a great and exciting topic? And they unanimously put up their hands because they're in the first class and they're all excited. And I say, look, all of humanity thinks that cognitive science is right, which is of course ridiculous because they realize, the f no, no, no. There's a pattern in that group that doesn't apply to the worldwide population, right? Mm -hmm. So they're mistaking a pattern in the data for the, for the pattern in the real world. That's called overfitting to the data. Right, right, okay. Your brain is sampling all day long. It's taking these samples and it's really sensitive and powerful. It's missing some, but we, and that's where you're doing the recognize to generate thing to try and come up with new patterns that you might have missed. But it's also overfitting to the data. It's finding lots of patterns in the samples that don't actually project to the real world, like the implicit learning, finding all kinds of correlational patterns that mm -hmm. aren't real. Right, right, right. So what do you need to do? Well, what did they, do? so this is a problem in neural networks. There's a problem in neural, they overfit to the data. So what, what have they traditionally done? They would turn off half of the nodes in the network, or they'd throw all kinds of static, useless, inf useless information into the network. Because what that does is it unlocks the system from that pattern, so it's no longer overfitted to the data. It sort of forgets the mistake. This is called, right, so what you're basically doing is you shut down the system, you flood it with noise, and it basically stops overfitting to the data. Now you don't do that too much or you kill the system. Mm -hmm. You gotta do it in a very controlled fashion. Like maybe when you're safe and not moving around and you can't harm yourself or harm other people and you only do it for maybe an hour at a time and we do it in a very limited situation, mm -hmm. we can get you to flood your brain with data, shut off a lot of the, the neurons, especially in your frontal lobes and get you to stop making forming all these mistaken associations. At the same time, you're practicing looking for missing associations. And so you're training, you're doing that generate to recognize for things you might be missing. Yeah. And you're doing this crazy process of trying to stop overfitting your brain and losing all of the mistaken associations you've malformed. Mm. Dreaming is doing I would argue, and many people would argue with me, not everybody, yeah. dreaming is doing those two wonderfully adaptive things at the same time. Right, and it's been speculated that um, the endogenous DMT in the human body is responsible for dreams and during REM sleep. Yep. And I don't know if it's proven or not, but the, the, the experience of DMT is very similar to what you described. Yeah, so what, and what's one of the overriding cross-cultural, cross-individual characteristics? Sensed presence in DMT experience. I sense presence. Yes. I meet yes. the space elves or I meet blah or blah. Right, right. Like third aliens. man experience. They're what? They're like the third man experience. Oh. Get up. You're in the snow uh, and your nose is bleeding. Space oh, elves coming wow. to you and telling you stuff you need to know. That is so wild. That makes so much sense. So, so. But, but, but no, could, could I just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have a culture in which all of these issues that we've been talking about, about all these things that are massively important for, for, for connectedness to reality, for having a sense of being connected to something that orients you and transforms you, that gives you, makes your life meaningful and worth living, that gives you a sensed presence that can give you like visionary, mystical, spiritual experiences. You have a culture that can't 
incorporate or right. educate you about any of this or teach you how to deal with it, how it's already happening in your everyday cognition, like I keep trying to show you and help you to overcome the self-deception that is massive through your cognition and my cognition. Where do you go if you want to cultivate wisdom? Where do you want to go if you want to cultivate these transformative states of consciousness? Where do you go? Yeah. That's the meaning crisis. That's the meaning crisis. You don't know. I don't know. Your culture can't tell you. All of this, all of this that cross culturally, cross historically has been powerful for people, motivating them, enabling them to cultivate wisdom, connectedness, transformative states of consciousness, insightful and virtuous relationships to each other, to themselves and to reality. All of that is people are starving for that. Mm -hmm. That's the meaning crisis. Hmm. So I ask my students, where do you go for information? They hold up their phones because they're all cyborgs, yeah. right? I say, where do you go for knowledge? And well, maybe the university, but we don't trust anything anymore. And then I say, well, where do you go for wisdom, for overcoming self-deception and foolishness, for transforming, for transcending so you can see things more clearly, more real? And then there's an anxious silence. And they look at me with beckoning eyes. That's the meaning crisis. So they're not taking the time to sit back and take their glasses off and look at their glasses. They don't know how. Who's right. teaching them? Who's and and it's not just not just a chatbot giving you text. Yeah, that's yeah. not good enough. You need role models. You need role models that you can in, internalize and imitate, recognize to generate. Third man fact. You need mm. role models. You need people that have consciousness and have embodiment, mm -hmm. suffer mortality. You don't have role models that you can identify with. You do not have traditions in which role models and ecologies of practices, living systems of practices for overcoming self-deception and affording connection, wisdom practices. Where where are those traditions? Where no, are those ecologies of practices? Where exist. are the role models? Yeah. They're not there. That's the meaning crisis. Okay, I have a... Uh a good follow-up question, but I have to take a leak first. Sure. So we'll take a quick break. <laughs>